Today we're going to do something different. Well, tonight we're going to do something different. We're going to speak about a very interesting subject. If you've seen Run to Christ on YouTube, he now joins us now. John, uh, welcome to the show. Good evening. So uh, John has been looking into some very fascinating subjects. We often cover the media and how this agenda is playing out through the media. And little did we know that not only with the connections that I've shown on YouTube uh, before when I've gone to Nemi, which means Holy Wood, which is just outside of Rome, and how that connects with Holy Hollywood, but there's actually seems to be some deeper nuances connected with Rome. And this is something I'd like to chat with to, to you, John, tonight about. Uh, there's a big word called intermurfica. Now, this is one of the things you came to me originally and said, the word intermurfica. Can you firstly explain what is this intermurfica? Right, well, it's a document that was put out in 1963, and it was done at the Vatican II Council, and it was a decree on the means of social communication. And at the time, you know, nobody is obviously familiar with the the term social media, but right in the title of the, of the document is a decree on the media of social communications. And what it basically is, is the Catholic Church's uh, decree that they need to kind of control what people are seeing in the media. And, and that includes, you know, radio, television, cinema, the press, all these sorts of things. And obviously, the internet wasn't around back then, but the language that they use is is very much it could be just describing today's world that we live in. You know, <clears throat> this might be a shock to some people to hear about Rome's involvement on that level. Why do you think that Rome has any interest in the media? Well, if if you um, know anything about the history of the Catholic Church, they like to control what people uh, believe, you know, because if you go back to the what is known as the Dark Ages, they, they themselves uh, kept the Bible pretty much hidden from public knowledge and only through their approved priests and bishops would they tell the, the laity, as they're called, the common people, what the Bible said. And often, more often than not, they would make up things that aren't in the Bible, which led to uh, Martin Luther's discovery when he's doing his 95 thesis, you know. He's like, where are all these things in the Bible? So the, the Catholic Church has got a long history of of um, censoring information, and for centuries and centuries they, they actually censored the Bible itself. You mentioned this history of control. What control actually does uh, this intermurfica give the Vatican in the media? Well, it's not so much that it, it gives them control over everybody else's media companies. It's just them setting out their intentions. You know, you know what I'm saying? So when they say we have to control what goes into a, a man's mind for, you know, it has to be morally good and it has to be in line with Catholic teaching and Catholic doctrine. Uh, this is a universal thing. They're not. They're not just um, trying to protect uh, so-called Catholics or Christians from from uh, maybe encountering uh, media that they would say is morally unacceptable based on things that are in the Bible. Okay, so like if you watch a movie and the movie's glorifying murder, then that would probably be a bad thing. And it goes further than that, though, because if you're an atheist and you're sitting there thinking, oh, well, obviously I'm not a believer, so the Catholic Church don't really want me to learn about uh, Catholic doctrine or whatever else. But and the sad reality is that most people, when you ask them questions about Christianity, uh, they will tell you or repeat almost... Um, almost word for word Catholic doctrine, you know, and apparently they're not affected by this control of the media, but it's obvious. I mean, if you look at movies, um, if you find a priest in the movies, it's always a Catholic priest, 
always, mm-hmm. always, every single I time. Yeah. yeah, every single time. It's not. Uh, there's no Protestants or or whatever at whatever else so, represent. So, do you think this is posing as morality, but in actual fact, is more of a dictatorship? Well, of course, because they <laughs> they will they will say all the things in the world to make it sound good. And if you read through the document yourself, I mean, you'd be sitting there as a Christian going, well, actually, that's a good idea to, to make sure that the media isn't... Uh, the media is always telling the truth and it's, tell, it's telling... Uh, promoting good moral guidelines, right? You should be like, why am, I, why am I bothered about that? But the thing is that... As I said, their Catholic teachings uh, are not to be found in the Bible. So, and the Bible also warns us about uh, people who appear to be Christians, but they speak like dragons. You know, where their language is different from what what they're portraying to the public. You know, and it's a very it's a very real danger that these things are shrouded in what's what's known as um, good and acceptable. So that they're easily digestible and the public will accept them, you know. But when you say Rome is involved in this heavily, uh, are you talking about certain card? I mean, I know maybe we're not entirely sure, but are you, do you think it's a, a broad thing or do you think there's a group within the Vatican that is involved in this? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. I mean, it's, it's there's a document that came out before Intermurfica and it's... It was um, ten years before that, or something like that, something like that, and that's called Miranda Process, and it's basically the same sort of thing, but it's a really, really long document, and that was um, sent out to all the bishops in the entire Catholic Church. And then we had Intermerifica, which came in the sixties, but as as I'm saying, like this is like doctrine that's put out there for the entire church. But as you say, there is a group that works to get this. Uh, agenda fulfilled you know and i would say obviously that would be the jesuit order what was the set you mentioned miranda process yeah that's a document it was a a letter to all the bishops that came out in 1957 i think that was and what does that outline yeah that outlines kind of the same things but it's not as it's not as um uh official or important as Intermurifica because obviously it was just a letter it's called a, an encyclical but that's just a fancy word for letter so the Vatican II Council meeting that's where Intermurifica was um, was first talked about and addressed so this is like the agenda you know whereas the, the, the previous document Miranda Process was like a, a letter to the to the bishops you know because they have that many different encyclicals, don't they? So some on the environmental, climate change, and and different oh, yeah. subjects. Yeah, exactly. And if you think that the the, the media is not following uh, the Pope, then all you got to do is look at the what the Pope says in the media, and does does the media then uh, go along with what the Pope says? And, and if you pick a subject, it's like if the Pope uh, mentions immigration, he, the Pope is pro-immigration and he's he's basically saying to all the nations around the world that you should accept migrants. And of course, what does the media then parrot to the public? The media, of course, are on side of mass immigration. And that's just one example that the Pope's been given, but... Um, that's that's it. If you if yeah. you check out the Pope and what he says, do the media, you know, agree with the Pope? And more often than not, they do. Yeah, no, it's so interesting. It, as you say, it's almost like you've got these different documents and encyclicals and letters that basically that these are put forward, and then we see the entire, well, much of the mainstream media and certainly different countries across the world, they're actually following suit of with these documents. Uh, of course, and it's like anything the Pope says, they they take it on board and jump, you know? I mean, what is it? In America, for the first time, Pope Francis was uh, addressing Congress. I mean, that's, that's just never happened before. And there was a time, a couple of years back, where 
the Pope wanted to discuss things about where Europe's going and you know what's what's going to be the consequences if Great Britain leave. And he called for a meeting with all the European heads of state, and they all just dropped everything and and went to see the Pope. You know, and what other what other world leader has that kind of um, drawing power? You know, like sway with world leaders. You know. Do you think there's something different about this particular pope? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I mean, even Catholics are are saying that Pope Francis is um, a heretic. You know, he's going against the tradition of the Catholic Church, uh, what they've established for years. You know, um, for example, uh, Pope Francis is is all for homosexuality, you know, he says, who am I to judge? He said that in the media, and what do the media push? They push a homosexual lifestyle, and they tell everybody to accept it, and... And atheists go to heaven, right? That's something else. He's right. been making many different statements right. against <laughs> traditional doctrine, even in the Catholic Church. Sure, sure, there is something different about it. I mean, he is the first Jesuit pope. That is probably quite important uh he's from south america he came from argentina and the new jesuit general superior is also from south america he's from venezuela and i don't know if you're aware about what's going on in south america but basically they are mostly socialist countries uh which are their economies are failing and they're you know there's people starving in the streets they're people are forced to eat their pets because they have no food and and if you know about anything about the history of socialism you know that it comes from the Jesuit order mm-hmm. yeah but it makes me think of Venezuela and places like that it's just terrible isn't it what's going on out there but... yeah that's that's what I'm saying like you know the, the Jesuit general superior he's from there you know <laughs> and it's, it's is this like... the uh Adolfo Nicholas, is that right? No, no, that's the that's the previous one. But here's the right. thing. Here's the thing about the Jesuit general. They're supposed to be in that position until they die. But we have at least five or, f- what was it, four? Four ex-Jesuit generals that are still living. Yeah, and they've, they've yeah. just passed on the position. The new guy is, um, hold on, I'll just find his name. No, uh, just to, as you're doing that, just to mention, coming back to what you said, it is amazing. I've spent a bit of time in Rome, and it's not only the people of Italy that some of them are very upset at the way the Pope gets involved in politics, but it's also within the Catholic Church itself. I noticed this divide that there's conservative Catholics putting up posters and billboards in Rome, which get swiftly taken down. Uh, against Pope Francis, so there is this real division, not only in Italy itself, but in the Catholic Church. So yeah, yeah, I would imagine there would be because you know they're used to, they're used to their traditions. You know, they're I mean they're pretty much all about their traditions, which a lot of them aren't even found in the Bible, but they like to stick to them, right? I mean, yeah. other things like the homosexuality thing and Pope Francis is, you know, who am I to judge? But if you know. That just flies against not only the Bible, but what Catholics themselves have taught. It just makes it makes you wonder where it's leading, doesn't it? Well, it's it's generally, I think, I think it's leading to a socialist agenda. I think they're trying to install socialist governments around the world, and and on purpose have them collapse, because the socialist system, it's never worked in history before, and it's it's doubtful that it will again. So that's my opinion on what they're trying to do there. Is like bring but he, he took over the Knights of Malta as well and uh, we see several different groups that he's taken command of, right. essentially. Yeah, and he, he's consolidating his power. That's what he's doing. We read that article. Uh, it was just last week. He's consolidating his power so that basically it's what he says goes, you know, and nothing really is delegated to to the lower bishops and cardinals, you know, it's all coming, consolidating back to, to back to him, you know. And just to mention this new guy, the Jesuit general, he's Arturo Souza. 
So I don't know if anybody wants to look that up, that's his name. Okay. Yeah, uh, on the subject of technology and going back to Intermorifica and, and these different documents that you mentioned of social media, is it true that Pope Francis actually met with the head of Google, Eric Schmidt, is it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, not only him, but he met with the, with the other heads of big tech. He met with, uh, you know, Zuckerberg from Facebook, and um, I can't remember the guy's name, but he was the owner of Inst- Instagram, but Facebook now own Instagram. But specifically what he said to the owner of Instagram uh, made me made me sort of prick up my ears, and he said uh, it's very important to talk about the power of images, and of course, Instagram is basically a an image sharing website, isn't it? So that just that just um, it rung some bells when I heard that. You know, I was like, wow, the power of images. You know, I just thought the image of the beast and things like that, and how an image is worth uh, what was it they say a thousand words? You know, so you can say a lot with an image, and I think the Pope and the Catholic Church are well aware of the power of the of media itself you know yeah and uh, there was also that eu wide digital act or something wasn't there that that seems to be quite a vast control well, grid potentially yeah, yeah it's uh, i think it was art, art, article 13 uh, the copyright okay. one i think that's what it's called but Basically, there was an uproar on that, wasn't there? I mean, yeah, yeah. most of the internet will change because of that in Europe, you know? And obviously that's going to affect uh, content creators at YouTube because, you know, if, even if they're even even if they based in America, their, their audience, a lot of their audience is also in Europe, so it will kind of mess things up for that. But, I mean, it's not... It's not set in stone, Article 13. Uh, it could be, you know, repealed or whatever, but knowing Europe and where they want to go with things, I highly doubt that they're going to change their minds on that. Hmm. So do you think a lot of this is deeply connected to the EU state? Oh, yeah, absolutely. You know, I mean, my... Um, Super state. Yeah, super state exactly. I mean, it's how it's how it's described in Daniel chapter two with a statue. You know, I mean, I've been over I've been over this quite a lot on my channel. I know there's a lot of Christians that don't don't agree with this sort of interpretation of the statue, but you know, I've done a lot of studying on this, and I really feel I really feel confident on it. The clay and iron feet are most certainly the nation's of Europe, you know, and the the ten toes or the ten kings of Europe, you know. So to me, this is definitely tied to the European super state, because that's where they want to go. They want to they want to create a, a European army. They want to create more consolidated power, and and that's that's what that's what their agenda is to to start the new world order, but. As the Bible says, the the feet will be struck by the rock, which is the coming of Christ. So that's what I'm looking forward to. Amen. Yeah. I mean, it's certainly interesting that we've got this Brexit and things going on. There's a lot of shifting of pieces I see in the world at the moment. You know. Yeah, it's it's absolutely it's quite an amazing time to be living in. Uh, if you're paying attention to you to what your Bible says. It's just unfolding right in front of your eyes. And a lot of people are like, you know, they might not know about these types of things or whatever, but you, it's really important because right now, history is unfolding straight from the pages of prophecy in the Bible. It's amazing. It's absolutely amazing what is going on. Well, in my opinion, it means we're really close, you know. Close, yeah. Yeah, do you? We've had so we've had this these theories online for a long time about certainly the Illuminati, which seems to in some ways go back to the Jesuits, uh, the Enlightenment, and Adam Weishaupt. And uh, do you think that this all-seeing eye 
could tie into this counterfeit means via technology of playing God, of trying to be like God and counterfeiting. But it, it could basically be describing this, that through these organizations like the Va- in the Vatican that we, we've already spoken about, that they're, they're essentially trying to take over the world by, uh, by doing this. Absolutely. It's a Jesuit New World Order. That's what I keep telling people. You know, there's a lot of talk that on the internet that it's the Jews who run the world, but it's absolutely not the Jews. That's not what the Bible says. You know, that's that's just one point on it, you know. Um, these organizations that are working together, they're all I mean, the Jesuits have their fingers in just about every pie that you can think of. They have their fingers in education. You know, at seminary schools, they have in universities, they have some of the best universities in the world. And it's like everybody wants to go there and be educated, you know. And it's 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 nothing new. That's what they've been doing for centuries, you know. I mean, you could go to a university in France, a top university in France, and it would be run by the Jesuits, you know. And this was back in the day where... Uh, Voltaire was um, his time when he was writing his writings and living in France and a strange thing about Voltaire as well, his his, uh, descendants are actually a Jesuit, there's a guy called uh, Telhard uh, what's his second name, I can't remember but he's called Telhard de Chardin that's it, Telhard de Chardin and he is the father of the New Age movement I don't know if you're aware of that but he, yeah, he's um, wow, he was, he like was, mysticism. Yeah, he was quite prominent in the formation of the United Nations. Uh, I've got a video on my channel called um, "The Truth About the History of the United Nations," and it goes into a bit about uh, Teilhard de Chardin. And yeah, he was actually a a, a relative, of, a descendant of Voltaire. So I thought that was quite wow. interesting. And even the Big Bang Theory had its roots in a Jesuit, did it not? I seem to recall. Yeah, well, I, th- I don't know if he was actually a Jesuit. I think he, I think he had the opportunity to become a Jesuit, but he, he okay. chose to stay as a just a, a an ordinary priest. But yeah, that it was called the the primordial atom theory, and it's basically the Big Bang Theory, and if you. If you were to say that to an atheist today, they'd probably go, what are you talking about, the Big Bang? Because they always, they always use the Big Bang theory as some kind of um, refutation against God and the Bible and things like that. And it's like, well, a Catholic priest came up with that, do you know? And they're like, what? <laughs> well, it's, certain, it's certainly interesting, isn't it, how the uh, evolution theory fits into that supremacist ideology that we see. Yeah, well, in- then... There you go, D- that Telhard de Chardin. Again, he was involved in the 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 pelt down man hoax, which was something that they dug up out the ground, saying it's the missing link. And he was involved in that hoax. And there's another one I can't remember the name. Of it. it might have been the Lucy one, which is quite famous. But he was involved in two archaeological frauds that were basically to propagate the theory of evolution and, and uh, you know, make it true in the minds of men, you know? Yeah, and of course, on the other hand, we have got that mystic, mysticism side that the Knights Templar, the Kabbalah sort of came into. So it's interesting how we see the residue of all of those things, especially when, I was, when you started talking about education, it made me think of the seven mountain mandate we see in the NAR churches. Yeah, right. So there's these uh, yeah. seven spheres. Yeah, there's also the city of seven hills. How, that's interesting, isn't it? You know? <laughs> yeah, seven hills, yeah. seven mountains. I don't know. Is it just me? <laughs> <laughs> but well, that, yeah, yeah that, and, and it's very political. It's very uh, supremacist. It's very extremist at, at the bottom of it all. Well, yeah, exactly. It, the Catholic Church are the same. You know, the Catholic Church are the same. They want to propagate the kingdom of god and and in fact you you can even find that language in the document into Murifica. you can find that language in there whether they're they're saying that we have the right as as uh 
like a divine right. We have the divine right from God to use these uh, different forms of media. We need to take control of this media and use it for the benefit of mankind, which is basically, oh, wow. yeah, you know, you can find all that language in there. Huh. So it really does link into it. Yeah. The Seven Mountain Mandate. Yeah, honestly, I mean, let, let's be clear here, right? I mean, if you're if you're if you're of a pro- protestant, um, a reformer or whatever, if you have that kind of theology in you, I know that a lot of people these days are seeming to uh, mock the reformers, but I think that's all part of the agenda as well. I'm not saying the reformers got everything right, but they got mm-hmm. quite a few things right, you know. And one of those things, even the Catholic Church even admit this as well, that now you're saying you're saying that like does NAR, does the NAR movement come from the Catholic Church? Does does all these mysticism things come through the ch- Catholic Church? What about all these other things? And it's basically, yep, they all come from the Catholic Church. And how can I be so confident in saying that? Well, the Catholic Church and the Bible themselves both confirm that they, the Catholic Church, are the mother church, okay? So they call themselves the mother of all daughter churches because the Protestants are not regarded as a sister church to the Catholic Church, you know? Like, like if you had two Protestant churches, like one was a Baptist and the other one was a Methodist, they might refer to each other as sister churches, you know? Because they're, you know, they're both Protestant and whatever else. But the Catholic Church, very specifically, Pope Benedict the Sixteenth said this, that the Catholic Church is not the sister of all the churches, but the mother of all the churches, okay? Now, when you look in the Bible, and what does it say about Mystery Babylon, who's the mother of all harlots, right? Now, every, yeah. time, I, every time I say this, it, it kicks up, it kicks up some fuss because basically I'm in a roundabout way I'm saying that Protestant churches are apostate because they wouldn't be a harlot if they were true to the Bible and true to God, right? So when when you say this to people who are in Protestant churches, they're like, Ugh, what are you talking about? This can't be true. But it is true. Look at all the Protestant churches now and how many of them are signing documents and declarations that they're going to forget what happened in the past and they're going to just shake hands with Rome and say sorry and get go back under their wing. That's basically what they're doing now, you know? And there's so many churches that are doing that, you know? So I don't think it's beyond the scope of theology to say that, yeah, when the Bible says the mystery of Babylon the mother of all harlots, I think that that's what it means. When you know and understand that Mystery Babylon and the woman that rides a beast is in fact the Catholic Church, then that whole, that whole thing makes sense. But if your thought theology is different, you might have a different take on it, you know, and that's fine. Yeah, yeah, I mean, of course, we see a lot of this infiltration, especially in the last few decades through these false leaders and the charismania, the NAR, the Dominion theology, uh, even the latter rain stuff. And we see that this has come through these false apostles, even calling themselves apostles, which actually is quite a Catholic thing, right? Because the apostolic church. Yeah, exactly. Um, they, they claim to be the succession of the, the apostles. Yeah, so we can see these offshoots that's come in just as, steal, kill, and destroy from the true Reformation understanding of the gospel, the five solas and all of these things. And and we see that subtly trying to chip away in many churches. But, of course, there is still the faithful remnant, and I believe there are still some. Of course, we have to be aware of these things for discernment purposes. And, of course, there's no perfect church, but there are still some churches that you can go into and, and they'll truly be seeking Christ in oh, the proper way but. absolutely absolutely there is i mean when I, when i say when i say that the the catholic church is the mother of all harlots that you know i'm talking about the leadership of these protestant churches and where are they taking people you know yeah there, there is absolutely brilliant churches out there the people that are within the churches i'm pretty sure they don't want to go under rome's wing again but a lot of no. the leadership and say 
the Luthers, the Lutherans, for example, they want to go back to Rome, and that's a big mistake. Well, and a lot of these conferences, you know, these big c- celebrity pastor conferences that we see springing up. Yeah. And that seems to be a big trend at the moment, but a lot of very pro, pro-unity, pro one-world religion stuff coming through these. Absolutely. It's all kumbaya and hold hands around the campfire. And, you know, a lot, I don't know why, but I don't know why they like to take these titles upon themselves. I don't know if it's pride or what, but... You know, how how can they call themselves apostles and prophets, you know? Scary. Like, like who gave them that who gave them that authority, you know? It's very so, scary. You know, because to me to me, the apostles got their authority straight from the Lord, right? Mm-hmm. So the word apostle means one who is sent, right? So they were chosen by Christ and sent out into the world. I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure he's not getting in touch with people these days and going, "I anoint you, my prophet. You are an apostle." He's just not doing that, you know. And you've got all these bands of people running around saying, "I'm the apostle. I'm the apostle. This and I'm the prophet that." And it's just they're so obviously, obviously false, but. For some strange reason, I mean, I guess the Bible explains it when it says that they'll heap upon themselves teachers for them to scratch their itching ears. Right? They want to, they, they want to hear this stuff, you know. And I guess that's why they they can't see it. They can't see it. Yeah, it really seems like it's the antithesis of Christianity that every every way I can see it tries to go against the way of the Bible. Yeah, and yeah. Scripture only. And even this attack on this Arminianism, which I know you've listened to that um, that priest, that ex-Catholic priest, I forget his name. Uh, do you remember his name? The one that uh, came out of it and oh, yeah. exposed this Arminianism influx. As... Yeah, Bennett, isn't it? It's Bennett. Yeah, something. Yeah. And uh, how this is kind of affecting even evangelism today, the evangelical movement, although it's got many good things about it and has done throughout the years, there's some of this influence has started to creep into some of the terminology. Well, I think it's I think it's been creeping in for a long time, you know, a long time. And just to mention what we're saying, it's Richard Bennett. That's the guy who. Wrote it. That's it. Yeah. So I think these things have been, you know, like seeping through the the theology of 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 uh, Protestants and other denominations and things like that for hundreds of years you know it didn't it didn't stick at first because obviously the the protestant reformation had just happened and if anybody was saying something that was contrary to protestant theology it was like no we're not accepting that that's not in the bible and blah 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 and it was only until years and years and years went past that that these kind of things crept into the churches you know where it's almost like they waited for the f- first couple of generations of Protestants to die, and then, and then started mm-hmm. propagating their false teachings back into the churches. Yeah, and an amazing time also, of course, with the King James Bible and the Guy Fawkes situation, and uh, that that time period, time period seems to have been a very controversial one between the Catholic Church, of course, and the protestant reformation that happened and so we pray for discernment going forward because it's almost like we see that they're trying to reverse the reformation and we see that over and over again yeah absolutely i mean that that is the the main agenda was to counter the reformation you know and it still is don't you know people think that uh the catholic church don't have the power that they once did and uh, it's just insane because the bible tells us that the beast will receive a wound a deadly wound, and it will appear as if it's dead, but then it will be healed, right? You know, Revelation chapter 13. So that, to me, is 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 uh, a very compelling reason to, to, to know that the Catholic Church has indeed not lost its power that it once had. I want to take you quickly back. You mentioned to me the other day about this word media, 
back to the media, the intermerifica, uh, you mentioned that the word media itself has actually got Latin yeah, it's roots. Got, Explain yeah. about this. Yeah, it's, it's a Latin origin. I mean, obviously, it can uh, it can mean like medium and things like that, and a medium can be, you know, people are probably thinking somebody that talks to the dead, and of course that is one of the definitions of medium, but medium can be, you know, DVDs, CDs, a newspaper, you know, that's the medium that you get your information out there, right? So media basically comes from an older Latin word, which is membrana, and this where we get our English word membrane, and if you look at the definition of membrane, it's something that stops, stops, uh, stops things from passing through, and it allows others to pass through. You know, so in terms of what they lay out in that document, Intermorphica, about controlling and making sure that people get the right information and prevent them from getting the wrong information then um, that that term, that word media, seems so appropriate for, for what they're actually trying to do. Wow. It is amazing. Like Yes, so it's, it's uh, like a, a veil or a filter. Yeah, it's definitely it. And if you look at what's going on uh, online with the social media websites, well, that's exactly what they're doing. They're filtering out things that they don't want on there. And they're creating algorithms that will do it all automatically and detect, uh, you know, banned words, so to speak, from your voice. And they'll demonetize your video or, or, or worse, they'll remove it or, you know, things like that. So they, with, the, with the sort of prevalence that fake news has took over the past year, you know, it's it's very important that, the media's agenda is is to control what you see and what you don't see, you know? So it's it's genius, really, because they create a platform in which everyone uh, relies on and this community is formed and kind of the world consciousness, to use a a word I don't like to use, but, you know, to to create this market square of the world online and then only once it's built up and built up and become extremely popular they then censor it yeah. and control what comes through yeah you see this this is a plan this is what i think they're doing they've created as you say the global you know marketplace the global town square for everybody to go and we're all using it and everything's hunky-dory and then and then they start their censorship campaigns and as you well know problem problem reaction solution right so what's the problem? The problem is that everybody's been censored and it's um, sometimes it's specific voices from the right wing or, or whatever else, you know, or it's a Christian voice that they're censoring. So basically, the problem is censorship. And what is the reaction that people are having to censorship? They're saying, ah, no censorship, thank you. This should be a free platform. You should be able to say what you want and give your opinion, Okay. So, what's the solution? Government regulation. That's the solution. And you might think that that's a good thing. Yes, Facebook should be regulated. Google should be regulated. And that's exactly what the past three years of censorship are, are, is designed to do. You had the problem, censorship, the reaction from the people using the, the global town square. The reaction was, we don't want this censorship. We need the government to regulate social media, even though they're private corporations, right? That's what everybody's calling for now. And what they're going to do is when the government comes in and regulates social media, people will appear to be more free, but then exactly the government have regulations in place, which means ultimately when church and state come together, they can fully control what is put on social media whereas before they're just a private corporation and they can basically do what they want you know i firmly Mm. believe that these social media websites and all these big tech companies were 
were um, were put out there on purpose so that one day, say the American government, for example, because Trump is very much in favour of regulating social media companies, he recently held a social media uh, conference, I suppose you'd call it, at the White House where he invited uh, a very high number of YouTubers who have been censored in one way or the other by, you know, Google. So he's taken steps to bring in regulations and everybody's saying, yay, this is a great thing. Is it? Is it really a great thing? Because I know the censorship is bad at the moment, but do you really want your government regulating Facebook? You know? I I would say no, but most people are probably all for it because of the three years of the the bad censorship that we've had, because obviously problem, reaction, solution. The people are in that reaction phase and they need something done about it, you know? Right, and of course it fosters that reaction. It fosters a revolutionary mindset too that underneath all of this we've got this chaos agenda that seems to be brewing yeah yeah absolutely you've got you've got violence in the streets you've got left-wing socialists being violent in the streets attacking news reporters and things like that all 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 by design all by design it's all one big giant show do you the, think that uh, do you think that some of these psyops are intentionally fosters like flat earth and other things do you think they're intentionally put in to the mix injected into the mix to yeah absolutely I, i've i've thought for a very very long time that what is known as the truth movement has been uh you know it was it was um controlled from the beginning that's what i think and I can give people loads of examples, but I don't know if we've got time to go in it today. But before, you know, I've I've witnessed the truth movement blatantly lying about a number of things. You know, one of them being uh, uh, school shootings and things like that. that I've, you know, they've basically lied, and I don't know why they're supposed to be truthers and they lie about things. So. <laughs> Yeah, well, flat, uh, so, flat so it's you mentioned before it's like this truth. What was it that from that movie you mentioned this truth um, organization, Ministry of Truth? Oh yeah, that's right. Nineteen eighty four. Yeah, the Ministry of Truth. <laughs> that's what the truth movement is. That's the online Ministry of Truth because they will just tell you the complete opposite of truth in order to get you know more hits on their videos and keep you from the truth that's my opinion and, and i've been on i've been online uh on youtube since 2007 uh at first i was just a researcher and i didn't publish anything but i've seen all this happening i've seen it all over the last decade people just making up stuff blatantly and what, what do you think is the end goal of that oh well, it's just to confuse you from from what the actual truth is you know I mean, let's take Flat Earth, for example. You know, do you know, it's just insane how many people believe in Flat Earth now, right? And if you try and give them a sensible, scientific, factual explanation for the cosmology of this this planet that we're on, they think that you're crazy and they think that you're a sort of brainwashed person. <laughs> like, And I'm mm-hmm. like, I'm like... Some of the some of the flat earth memes are just grossly hilarious, you know, and they just you know they see sunlight coming out the clouds and they make a meme out of that, and obviously that means the sun is not ninety three million miles away or whatever, you know. And you try and talk sense to them, and they, they just have no no sense whatsoever. Sorry, flat earthers, but you don't. And <laughs> I think yeah. personally, personally, flat earth is out there to make sure that if you're a sort of scientifically minded kind of chap and you're not too sure about the Bible, you don't really believe it, and all these flat earthers come along and convince you that the Bible is a flat earth book, you being scientifically minded or whatever, you're definitely going to reject the Bible. You're definitely going to reject it. 
So do you think overall, or these psyops in general, do you think this whole thing is meant to lead people away from the true Christ and into distractions, deceptions, yeah. and ultimately destruction? Yeah. I mean, if you're sitting there worrying about space aliens invading the planet, then, you know, what? how much are you thinking about your own accountability for the sin that you've committed in your life? Are you really... yeah, things about makes me think about Planet X and all these type things. Exactly. I mean, how many conspiracy theories have we been through in the past decade, you know? Yeah. Lots, lots, you know? All these, like, Planet X is coming, or the, the alien-demon hybrids are coming, uh, all these kind of things. Flat Earth, you know? Uh... <laughs> Well, and, and date setting as well. There's been a lot of that, of course. But Yeah, of course, the world is going to end on September the 23rd and things like that, you know. That mm-hmm. happens every year, by the way, but we're still here. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I mean, I just I just thank God that I've come out of that because I used to be in the mix of that. I know how destructive it is, you know. It's, yeah, uh... absolutely. So did I. I. I came through Christ, through all these conspiracy theories, you know. Yeah. I used to be the kind of guy that believed zeitgeist, you know. You know mm-hmm. that movie where it just said that, like, the son of God is the actual sun in the sky. Ha, ha, ha. You've all, yeah, been, yeah. you've all been fooled, you know? And I used to have that mentality. I was like, yeah, man, that video's <laughs> awesome, you know? <laughs> and, uh, like, one day I got schooled by a Christian who completely knew the history of ancient Egypt and all these other things that the, the movie was saying. And I had no answer to it. I had no answer to it. So... Eventually, I came through all of that, finding the answers, you know? And all these, that's what these conspiracies are. It's just a big, giant distraction to stop you thinking, oh, hey, wait a minute, I've broken God's holy laws. Maybe I need a saviour, mm. you know? A lot of rabbit holes that take us away from the yeah, gospel. Yeah, blue beam and aliens, you know? It's like, just, yeah. just sit down, sit down, forget about all these mad conspiracy theories and just recognise... That you need a saviour. That's the bottom right. line. And that's the thing, and that's a good point. You mentioned that you came through that, and also I've got the same testimony. So if there is anyone out there that is been that is in the middle of that, there is still hope, you know, that Jesus can still save us. And oh yeah, yeah. Come I back mean, to him, you know? oh, absolutely. I mean, just just because you're a conspiracy theorist doesn't mean that you're not eligible and welcome into the kingdom. Do you know what I mean? Because whosoever believes in the Lord shall be saved, okay? And that's my favourite word in the entire Bible, whosoever, you know? Because anybody can be saved, everybody's invited, you know? Everybody is called to repentance. But if you're sitting, spending your time, you know, thinking, you know, are the Ghostbusters going to come and fire the blue beam up? And then are the aliens going to come and get us? You know, if you're sitting thinking about all these things, you're wasting your time. The ultimate truth is Jesus Christ, and that's just that's just that. So we've talked a lot about the Vatican. So just finally, ultimately, the, the real battle, of course, is not against flesh and blood. It is a battle against the principalities, the powers, the the in high places, and and the verse that Paul says. So, would you agree with that? That this our ultimate battle is a spiritual one uh, beneath this. Absolutely. Uh, that's where the battleground is. It's a spiritual battle. And the verse that you just said is proof of a global conspiracy, but not the one that you think, you know? It's like we're we are at war with higher powers, right? And the person running the show of the conspiracy strings, it's not space aliens, it's not whatever, it's Satan, the devil, your adversary, and Jesus Christ defeated him. And you need to repent and just believe. Yeah, because ultimately people are making this all about the elite when in actual fact it's a much deeper, much bigger thing that, than any human beings could do. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's like, you know, it, you know, there's that um, saying where how can you keep a conspiracy secret where all those people must be involved? You know, if it's a global conspiracy... How are they keeping it secret? And it's well, it's, I don't think they actually all know what the other guy's doing because it's not them that's running the show. You know, every man's a sinner, and the devil will use that. That's just a simple fact. 
So what would your message be to pe- all the people that are listening here that have been involved in this uh, truth movement and are are coming to know that the gospel is the only real truth? Well, I would I would say to them, you know, like have a look at have a look at the Bible. You know, there's much more mystery in the Bible than there is in these conspiracy theories that you're maybe watching on YouTube and whatever. You know, the mystery of God shall be revealed. And it's going to be soon. It is going to be soon. You can look at God's time clock and his time clock is Israel. All you need to do is look at why. Why is Israel once again a nation after 2,000 years? Something is happening and it's time for Christ to return. So if anybody's listening, I would just ask you to believe in Jesus. Put your trust in him. Never mind all these conspiracy theories. Because ultimately, when you're before Christ and you're before his throne, what good is knowing all these conspiracy theories going to do you? You need to know Christ. John, from Run to Christ on YouTube, thank you very much for joining us today on RSE Radio. You're very welcome, brother, and I'll see you again soon. Thank you. God bless. God bless.